Good morning. So I know, I know last week I really pumped up the idea of, hey, you're going to hear from a ginger next week, which is a redhead person. And, and I thought about dyeing my hair red, but I'm not sure the dye would take because my hair is so old and full of wisdom. Right? Who's with me there? Yeah? Who's with me? Now I want you to know, I started having gray hair in middle school, so my wisdom started early. <laughs> What's your excuse, right? That's the... So yes, I got uh, a couple texts from Nate, and it's like he said, uh, I was with some guys that were, that were uh, tested positive, and I'm not sick yet, so let me know how it goes. And, and then Saturday morning, he says, well, I'm so far so good. He went for a jog with his dad. And then Saturday evening, he sent me a text, says, well, I got a small fever and a sore throat. And I go... Well, send me your notes. I think I'm going to preach. And then he sent me his notes and realized, Nate, most of your notes were in your head because that page didn't have a lot on there. So, <laughs> so uh, he, uh, he was ready for you, and, and I am as well. So if you're new here, I'm not usually the one preaching. I'm usually the one doing youth stuff. And, uh, and someone said they love me. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, but Jason, he's on vacation. Actually, he's, he's cheating on us. He's uh, visiting another church here in town just to get away from us and... I don't know what you guys did to him, but, you know, whatever. So he did the wedding yesterday, he's, uh, and then he's going to do some stuff this afternoon. So hope you're okay hearing from the youth pastor two weeks in a row. We will have fun today. It might be short, but uh, it's not exegetical. It's more devotional, but it will change your life. <laughs> by, by these two things, you know, it'll change your life. No. Um, so, uh, yeah, be praying for Nate. I don't think he's super sick, but he's sick enough to be sick. So, um, there you go. So real quick, I'm going to give you a quick uh, introductory illustration, then we're going to probably pray a lot, and then uh, we're going to do, I have some visual aids, and I'm and, uh, and actually going to um, do some crowd participation a little bit. And somebody might get shot today <laughs> with a Nerf something, so it's all, it's all good. So, um, so I want you to imagine uh, two different families are about to construct a house, okay? Uh, family A, we'll say A, everybody say A. Family A is going to do the way of the normal way of constructing a house. They're going to hire an architect or an engineer. They're going to get some plans of some sort, and then they're going to get the contractors and subcontractors. Hopefully, they're not ones that some of you are using that take too long. But um, you're going to get all these guys lined up, and then you're going to have the building inspector. You're going to make sure they come in and inspect your build. And then you're going to have certified plumbers, electricians, all the things you need to do to build a house. And their house is going to be built, and it's probably going to be pretty solid and beautiful and great, okay? That's A, okay. Now, over here, we got person B. Everybody say B. Thank you. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, So person B, they're going to build a house. And like, you know what? We're going to pinch some pennies. We're going to do it all ourselves, all right? So we're not going to hire an architect. We're just going to build it as we go. Uh, We're going to get some two-by-fours and some nails. Uh, We're not going to do a, we don't need plumbers. It's just water goes downhill, right? So we'll just do our own plumbing. And we're going to, you know, maybe... We'll, we'll forget the building inspector. They, they take too long to inspect it, but we'll do our own thing, right? And then the, we're going to not hire electricians that are certified. It's just black to black and red to red, right? It's, it was play, it was all fine, right? So that's B, and their house is, is done. Now, which house? Now, let's turn, well, which house would you buy, A or B? A. But you can afford B. We're still going to go for A? I'll save up for A. So it kind of reminds me of my wife. I've been watching this show once in a while. It's called... Um, I think it's called My, F- My First Flip. Anybody seen that one? No? So, four of you. Great. I'm proud of the rest of you for not watching HGTV all the time. But um, so it's My First Flip. And these, these, these people that come in and then the, the film crew films them. Like, film crew, you should probably say some stuff because they're doing things that are wrong. So these guys are flipping a house. And, and they're, they're, um, it's like the one episode I saw is this, this, um, a retired mother and her daughter. Neither of them have ever done any kind of carpentry work at all. And they're about to flip a house. And the, the house looks like it was built by a person B, right? It was just a total wreck. And so uh, and at the end of the show, of course, it's all pretty and polished and painted, but we know what's in those walls. We saw the, the show, and, like, I would not buy that house. So, so I think uh, so the, the whole idea is we want to make sure we are person A. We want to build that house. Which house is going to stand? Obviously the first. And so, so if we uh, substitute the word the Lord for all those helpers, If I'm going to build a house, I want the Lord to be my engineer. I want the Lord to be my architect. I want the Lord to be my, I want the Lord. So if we put the Lord in all those spots, that's what the psalmist is talking about in the first part of our psalm today. We want to make sure that the Lord is part of the build. If he's not part of the build, then you're building the house B, and it's going to fall. 
Jesus had a pet story about that, right? Build my house up on the rock, house upon the sand. When the winds came down, the house and the sand went whoosh, right? The kids are probably learning that today. So let me pray for us. And I'm going to read through the psalm again a little bit, and we're going to uh, dissect this. And again, I had like three hours to prepare, so let's be a little more devotional than exegetical, but it'll still be fun. So let me pray for us, and then we'll dive in. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for, for how you love us, how you equip us, how you provide for us. And Lord, forgive us for when we don't include you in our lives. We know that we blame you when things go wrong, but it's really because we didn't include you that things went wrong in the first place. So Lord, help us to recognize that, to understand that, and to you just use me as a vessel to teach us what you want us to learn today from Psalm 127. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us a place to serve, to worship, and to grow. And then Lord, help us to be sent from this place to tell others what we learned today. Thanks in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, we're going to read this song. I'm just going to read the first few verses, first two verses of Psalm 127. I did recently, that's why he was like usually on the app. Yeah, I did upload notes like 30 minutes ago. So your app should have like, like two notes, but there's the, the scriptures there. It's also going to be on the screen. I use the NLT version when I, when I read and teach because I just like how it flows better. Um, nothing theological. It's just kind of a, a flow thing. And, and it's not progressive insurance. It's not that flow. It's a different flow. Those are the jokes, people. Those are the jokes. Okay. <laughs> so verse 1, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Let's dissect this a little bit. First of all, I learned this, that this is probably not written, it says it says uh, a Psalm of Solomon, but really i the commentary as I looked at it, it says it's probably written for Solomon. I'm like, oh, wait, that turns a lot of lights on because Solomon was given the task to build a temple and to protect the city and do all these big things. And so it's possible that David, his dad, left some parting words for his son Solomon as he went to, to build and plan and do these things. I'm like, well, that kind of makes a lot of sense. So if that's true, we learned something today, right? That's good. So, so it's probable that it was written for Solomon, not a guarantee because I wasn't there when it was written and some of the commentaries also weren't there, but they think that it was probably written for Solomon and to encourage him to grow and to develop his skill as uh, a follower of the Lord and do these things. Include the Lord while you build. And we all know Solomon didn't always follow the Lord. He um, was actually pretty bad at that, but he has some shining moments, right? He's given the task to build a temple, to defend a city, and this psalm of ascent, remember these, these psalms of ascent were meant to be sung as they traveled up the road to Jerusalem. So I, I imagine there's, a, there's some rhythm, there's some chant, there's some, some, some fun parts to it. And so this song is to, as they go, and think of this, they're, they're approaching Jerusalem. It's a psalm of ascent. They're going to go visit the temple. They're going to go visit the, the, the big city. And they're going to see the things that Solomon was supposed to include the Lord in building. That's kind of cool. It kind of gives a little bit of texture to the psalm limit, right? Um, so uh, first of all, look at this. Uh, I looked some words up here. So in verse 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. That word is a Hebrew word. It's pronounced, I believe, saw. Everybody say saw. You are bilingual or more today. So you speak Hebrew, saw. And that means empty, pointless, worthless, nothing, vain. Okay, that's what that word there is. So unless you, unless you uh, include the Lord in your build, the, the workers, their work is wasted, pointless, it's, it's, it's vain. And then it goes on. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. That word no good, also the same word, saw, pointless, empty, vain, no good, worthless. So there's some, wow, so the psalmist is doing some, some poet, poetic stuff here. And then again, a third time, verse 2, it is useless for you. That word useless is the same word, saw. It is empty, wasted, vain, no good for you to work so hard for early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. So this word saw is empty, pointless, worthless, nothing, vain. Welcome to depression. Everything is vain. This kind of sounds like Ecclesiastes a little bit, vanity, vanity, other things, nothing, everything is worthless. But he's saying these specific things are worthless because why? The Lord is not in it, right? So the, the, the setup of the swords has got very poetic as the, uh, the first two uh, say, unless this, then this, unless this, then this. And, of course, that last little verse is all about kind of a description thing. So uh, the last part kind of sets up for a, a little bit of texture there. 
Uh, but that, that last bit there, verse 2, kind of sets up an exhausting scenario, right? It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food. You just work, 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 day, night, work. It's exhausting, but guess what? All that work you're doing is also empty, useless, vain, worthless. Stop it. Now, is he saying that we should stop building, stop working, and stop guarding? No. He's saying do those things, but have the Lord be a part of it, right? So they, uh, there's three bonus points here. So point one is life without the Lord is empty and pointless. Right there. Is it there? I don't know if I have the thing there. But life without the Lord is empty and pointless. That's the first two verses. And some three bonus points. Building a house without the Lord is helpless, hopeless, pointless. Building a, guarding a city without the Lord is pointless. And then working hard and working for food without the Lord also pointless, empty, vain. Those are your three sub points. Do you see the pattern? A little bit of pattern. I think it's obvious, right? It's pointless to not see the pattern, right? So now, uh, this reminds me of a verse in the New Testament, which was, was kind of a, a mantra for me as a high school kid doing a job. I used to work at a place called Pace, which is, I think, bought out by Costco. It was the same idea. It was in the Midwest. And I was, uh, had a couple of jobs at this, at this Pace membership warehouse. My first job, of course, was the cashier. And I want you, it was a little brag, braggadocious time now. I held the record for the most consecutive uh, end of shifts with exact change, precise precision in my drawer. <laughs> I worked one day. No, no, I worked for, for months. It was for, it was for months. It was, it was a pretty, pretty substantial thing. And I was, uh, so my, my mantra in my, in my mind as a high school kid, and in, because in, uh, my youth pastor hammered it into me, it was Colossians 3.23. And all you do, do it as a for the Lord, not for man. So I worked not for my boss. I worked for the Lord. So everything I did, I had that in my mind. And when I got a little bit lazy or slacked, I put, nope, nope, I'm working for the Lord, not for man. So the cash chore was precise. I made sure I counted it all. I didn't, didn't get lazy in my accounting. Used let the calculator do the work instead of my brain because, you know, whatever. So I went from there to the freezer. It's like I want to get a, a bonus, a different job. So I went from the cashier position to the freezer, stock the freezer. That was two weeks, man. That was cold. I did not like, it was, in, it was in, in Iowa in July working in the freezer. You'd think it'd be great, right? But no, you have to dress up in winter clothes to go inside a freezer in the middle of like hell outside. It was awful. So, so, um, so I lasted two weeks and I said, hey, can I do something else? Because I'm just not built to be in your freezer in July. I'm a high school kid, whatever. So then I, I got the position of, of stocking shelves and, got, and I grew to the spot of being a forklift driver. Guy okay, was the beep, beep guy that annoys you at Costco. That was me. <laughs> that was before we, the time they said they couldn't drive when customers were there. I drove all over the place, man. It was great. Get out of the way. So, uh, so I'm, I'm beep beeping around, right? So this is the, the mantra becomes more important as I got to be a forklift driver because I can make a lot more mistakes. That could be dangerous. And it's like, okay, now wait, Darren. Slow down. Talk slower or whatever. Uh, but do your work as if for the Lord, not for man. So one evening, so I had the after school shifts when school started, and I was like the, the – like, Two, three o'clock, whatever it was, to nine o'clock, and it was the, the last end of the day shift. And by the way, a little sidebar the guy who trained me, his name was Aaron Brown. <laughs> and I'm Darren Brown. He was a little taller than me, but so, uh, so I'm working the forklift, right? So I go over this one spot, and it's a place where there's a, like a, a pallet of like tied laundry detergent or something. And so I pick it up, move it out of the way to go put it somewhere else, and I saw, oh, that's a bunch of detergent, liquid detergent on the floor. I could have put it right back there and left it for the morning crew and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. But Colossians 3.23 came to mind. Do everything you do for the Lord, not for man. So I, I picked it up, whopped it up, got the kitty litter to get up all the goop. and So it was all, it was all clean and put it down. So that was the first chance I had to really force myself to go back into, no, 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 do it for the Lord, not for man. The second time, it was in the evening shift again, end of the day. I'm getting ready to go park my forklift back to charge the battery. And I'm just zinging around the corner, and I swoop it around, and, I, and I, there's a big pallet of Mountain Dew. Yeah, you see where I'm going? Big pallet of Mountain Dew, and I whip the forks around, and I clip the bottom corner of the Mountain Dew. And guess what? Avalanche! So, oh, so 144 cases of 24 on the floor. And I had to go back to Colossians 2.23, and all you do, boy, I did that damage for the Lord, didn't I? No, I had, I had to stack it all up there, and I wrapped it in plastic, and all the ones, I, I only poked holes in like four of them, and then a few, a few of them kind of went down and rolled around, and kind of rolling across, like maybe a, maybe a case total of, of damaged goods, but 
My ego was damaged. My time clock was damaged. I stayed late. I put it all back up there, kind of scoop it up what I could and stack up these cans, and it was Colossians 3.23. Do all you can, all you do, in word or deed, for the Lord of the Lord, not for man, right? So here's the thing. I'm going to show you, uh, we have these visual aids here. I'm about to show you a pie chart that is going to change your life. Say, ooh. Okay, so the first pie chart, you're going to have to give yourself on this one. So this is, uh, this is a circle-ish, okay? And we're going to divide this pie up into sections, and I want you... I'll get you started here. I'll give you like, uh, I don't know, this is, not a, this is like Trivial Pursuit pie, right? Um, I'll give you an example of what I want you to do. I want you to kind of give me some ideas of what areas of your life that you have. I'm going to give you like, okay, one area would be family. One area might be work. What are some other areas of life that we have that are kind of categories that we, we exist in, we live in? Friends. Friends is a big category. Oh, hang on. Whoa, E-N-D-S. School. I'll go sideways. Okay. Finances. Cash. Okay, what else? Hobbies. Church. Church. Oh, good answer. Good answer. <laughs> I'm going to say slash God just to be bold. Okay, what, one more. Entertainment. Entertainment. I want my MTV. Okay. So. <laughs> This is, a, a lot of people say, this is my categories of life, right? They say, uh, I, I have all these responsibilities, all these places, and of course, God, God is part of that. God in church is part of my, my daily routine or weekly routine or some of you yearly routine, once a year, you Christmas, Easter people, come on. Um, so uh, so this, I want you to know that this, this is one example that this is also, I will call this, this is the lie. What? You just lied to me. So this is the lie. This, this pie chart represents a false perspective of how Psalm and Colossians are teaching us about how the Lord is part of us. So, so the bigger pie chart, this is the, the correct one. And I'm going to, this is, this, this is the pie chart that'll change your life, okay? So this is the big circle, big pie, and I want to put one in the middle. And guess what I'm putting in the middle? What's your guess? What? You are reading my notes. Okay. And so then you got your pie chart, right? And everything is going to be the same, except you have one extra piece of pie, because Where's he at? God just moved to the center. So you got, well, we have friends and work. What else did I, what else did I say? Family. Family. School. I want my MTV. Okay, what else? Yeah. Oh, cash. Hobbies. And then we got the bonus one, which is now we could add one because we just removed God from your life, right? No, we didn't. But we have more. <laughs> so now we can what, do what? Chores, really? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, so this pie chart will change. This, this, this is what we're going to call this one truth. Because we notice that, uh, yeah, it's, it's hieroglyphics. So we notice that in this case, God is not just a part of our life. He's a part of what? All of our life. Okay, now let's go back to the psalm and read that first verse. Unless the Lord builds a house... The work of the Lord is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries will do no. So unless you have God as a part of your work, a part of your chores, a part of how you spend your money, a part of your entertainment, a part of your, unless God is part of everything, then you're living a lie. And you are shorting yourself of what the, the end of verse 2 says. For God gives rest to his loved ones. You are shorting yourself, but God kind of rests because you're wasting your time. Pointless. It's, it's what, what are the word? Pointless. Vain. Useless. No good. This, you, can you produce good with this? Yeah, I'm doing church. Okay. We, we, could, we could still give that a grade, but you're not giving, getting life to the fullest because you're, you're compartmentalizing God. God's got to have a thread that runs through all of your life. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Is your life changed now? Okay. So when we submit, we can't just have, have, have the Lord be a part of our lives. He has to run through all of our lives. Otherwise, what we do begins to feel pointless or um, uh, empty or, or vain. And maybe some of you in the room are thinking, yeah, there are some things that, man, he's right. My job has been super pointless lately. lately. I, I drove a forklift, a membership warehouse. I was like a teenage kid zipping around, beep, beep, beep. You can really think, I'm just stocking shelves. That's all I'm doing. How do I put the God part into my, what a, feels like a pointless job? Well, I could do ministry while I'm at work. I could do a good job while I'm at work. 
just working hard and doing a good job honors the Lord. Doing a job just to get it done so I can clock out. Some days, I guess you're going to be that way because just how it is. But you want to have to, for, as a high school kid, I had to, had to push myself. Darren, don't just do the job to clock out. Do it as if God's your boss because God is my boss. Now my, my, now when I was a cashier, my boss happened to be a believer as well. And so he, it was kind of fun that he would see, I'd be able to kind of encourage him a little bit. And there's a, uh, oh, I'll leave that moment. That's a, I was going to give you a freebie, but yeah, it's not necessary. So when we submit and surrender our lives over to our designer, our perspective may be a little different, okay? So when I, when I began to push this idea in my, in my Colossians 2.23 life, at my work, my perspective of work became a little bit different. I would say it became healthier. Now, is it perfect? <laughs> no way. I'm knocking things over. I'm doing dumb things, whatever. So, but it's not, it's not perfect, but it's, my perspective is different. And so I can enjoy my work because God's my boss, and God's a good boss, I wish he paid more, but he's my boss, right? So there's where the poem transitions to the idea of rest. Once we recognize that we, we need to be with, with the Lord, this is the big word, I, I circle this when I do the use with our kids at, at our conference. I said, when you read John, how many times was Jesus say he was with his disciples? He was with his disciples a lot. And that's the idea. You're making disciples, you're with somebody. God is with us. When we, we do this, we say, okay, God is not with me over here. He's only with me here. That's the lie. No, whether you like it or not, he's with you. Are you paying attention to him? That's the bigger question. Are you inviting him to say, hey, wake me up. I want to pay attention to you, right? So here's the thing. What, what, is, what is bringing you unrest? Uh, what is keeping you up at night? And usually the things that keep us up at night are things we can't control. Sometimes they're things we can't control. Your, your, uh, your money, your job, their stress, the bills. There are some things that are, that are okay, those, those are real, real things. But a lot of times we step and I, and we, we, we stress about things. Can you, can you really control that? No. That's the kind of thing, give it up to the Lord. Let him have it. You can't control it. I can't control the president. <laughs> I wish I could. Someone else is. But, so uh, I wish I could control. <laughs> I said that out loud, sorry. So, uh, that's the kind of thing, if I, felt, if I allow that to keep me up at night, I can't control that. I got to give it up. I can pray for him. I can pray for my leaders. I can pray for uh, people. I, I have missionaries, friends that are across the globe. I, I, can't, I can't jump in and, and fix their, their problems. I can pray for them. I, those are the things you got to say, God's in their life too, and he can control things over there. So what do I do? My role is to, to put, make sure that God is part of my build and, and go on from there. It's the question of what's bringing you unrest. We must do what we can to let go and trust God. This does not mean to stop working and start napping. No. We have been given a task since creation. Adam was given a task at creation. He says, here's the, here's, the, here's the planet. Now farm it. Now take care of it. Now work the land. Do a job. And make sure you rest on that seventh day. So there's a pattern of rest and work. So a lot of times for us, I know some of you, I've seen your prayer requests, some of you are... Work, 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 because your people are being ask, asking you of a lot of stuff, and you don't have time to rest. Well, whew, how do you say no? I can't answer that for you, but you got to figure it out, how to have that pattern of, of rest, because if you work, 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 without God being a part of it, it's just going to be a, it's going to feel pointless. You're going to burn out. You're going to get angry. You're going to come home and say mean things to your family. It's just not a healthy spot, but if the Lord is part of it, Hey, do it for the Lord, not for man. And that's the part you got to think, how's that, what's that look like for you? What's that look like for you? So again, uh, much like last week, these Psalms of Ascent are, being, are meant to be sung as the people are marching up the hill. They're a celebration, a reminder of what God is doing, what God has done, and what we need to make sure we're passing. These songs are sung in a way to pass down to the next generation all the things the Lord has done, which brings us to point number two. Number two is this, children, ah, children. Painful as an arrow, but useful in battle. Okay, so that's the next part here. We're going to read this. This is, I didn't have a lot of time to, you know, pontificate and alliterate the message points. But So verse 3, 4, and 5, it says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children are born to a young man. Children born to a young man are like arrows on a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. 
he will not be put to shame when he confronts the accusers at the city gates. Again, this, let's take a peek at how this is structured a little bit before we kind of do, go too far. There are, um, children are a gift from the Lord. Sometimes as you raise kids, there may be days when you want to ask God for the gift receipt. <laughs> you parents know what I'm talking about. There are some days this child is a gift from the Lord. Where's the receipt, right? Uh, but then you, you get to eventually watch your kids grow up and do amazing things. So you are older parents, you say, yes. I wanted the gift to see a long time ago, but I'm glad I didn't ask for it because my kid is amazing. I love my kid for this. I've done these amazing things. Um, you might say that that was a blessing. And I, I've told my kids this before. They're all, I have one child here somewhere. Where is he? There? I've told them before. I says, you guys, you make your parents look good because you guys are good kids. And you make us feel like, wow, you must be awesome parents. Well, no, we have good kids. So, um, so there's a, so I, I do have great kids, and I, and I appreciate that. And, and children are like arrows in a warrior's hands. Here's a quick video to wake you up. It's impossible. Okay. So if you go to youth group at all, if you bring a friend to youth group, we do this thing called the impossible shot. You and your friend get two shots with a Nerf arrow, and we put a small target on the back of the wall, and if you hit the target, you get a prize. So, in the light of me not having a lot of time to prepare, we're going to have some fun today. I'm going to shoot Uncle Dan in the back of the room with my arrow. All right, Dan, are you going to catch this? If I hit you, I get a hug or a donut. Ready? Okay, if you're in the way, you might get an eye out. Here we go. Ready? Oh, I got dug. Okay. I get two shots. Now, for some reason, when our youth do it, they go like, like way like this, and they're going to, so they might see dents in the sheetrock up there, but, um, so we got these arrows. I'm going to try and shoot Danny now. Here we go. Oh, that's him. Okay. It's no prize for me. I'm sorry. But, so here's, why am I showing this? Uh, one, is something fun, but also to think of this. Um, at, you might have kids. You say, my kids are an impossible shot. They are the quivers in my, or the arrows in my quiver, I would like to take the quiver out and shoot the kid. Um, so sometimes children may feel like an impossible shot. My child is impossible. It's difficult. You may have a difficult child, and I get that. Um, you might th- think to yourself, oh, my kid, will my kid ever do X, Y, Z? Will my kid ever straighten up? Will they ever figure it out? Will my kid ever be potty trained? Maybe they're, if they're a teenager, they probably should. <laughs> but if we apply the first part of the psalm, Raise your kids with the Lord. Um, And the idea from the last week, we talked about the idea of the Bible applied changes lives, yours and those around you. If you raise your kid with the Lord. Now, this. um, Are we raising our kids in Christ or simply near Christ? There's a huge difference. This is raising a child near Christ. This is raising a child in Christ. That's a different way to do things. So we look at this, this psalm, and the children are a gift from the Lord. Yes, they are a gift. They are a reward. There's a lot of, of, of cultural things in that, that phrase. Uh, they, uh, culturally, uh, they want to have big families. They want to make sure their family name is going on and on. And, and then, then it says they they're are born to a young man, like are like arrows in, the, in a warrior's hands. So there's skill involved because an arrow is not just grown like a plant. No, you have to take the stick, you have to prep the wood, you have to prep the steel, the front, whatever it is, if it's a stone or a metal, you have to prep the arrow to be useful. So like an arrow in a, in a warrior's hands, your child is weaponry for the family. And we have to raise that child and prepare that child because the world is full of danger. And we're about to launch our children into a dangerous place. Is that child prepared? And here's the psalmist is saying, children are born to young men are like arrows in a warrior's hands. Now, a warrior is very skilled. In this case, very skilled. This guy would, would you know, beat me up, right? Um, but how joyful is a man whose quiver is full of them, full of these arrows, these prepared arrows, because they don't just defend themselves, they defend the family. It's like church mafia. It's the family, right? Kids are meant to be, they're not meant to be raised and kept in the nest, Kids are the arrows that are not meant to be kept in the quiver. They're meant to be launched. They are to go into the dangerous places, and they should do so prepared. Are you preparing your kids? Now, maybe saying to yourself, hey, thanks, Darren, this is great, um, but uh, I don't have any kids, so 
why, here's, a, here's this is going to hurt a little bit, okay? My heart aches when I hear people who say that because I have several fatherless, parentless kids that come to youth group, and they would love to adopt you for like an hour and just sit at youth group and let them just be near a caring adult. Um, I have this, this, this vision in my head of a five-to-one ratio, five adults per kid at Harvest. Not five adults per kid at youth group, no. But I think of a, if, if every child, we are all raising these arrows. We're all involved. They watch you. They see you. They hear you. They, they observe you. In some cases, they crave a relationship with their parents that you have with your kids. So think of that. But a five-to-one idea is this, if, if every child in this building had five adults that would care for them, that would help them have a raise my child with Christ mentality. Not just that. So if a kid comes in the door, if the ushers know them by name, if the coffee person knows them by name, if the Sunday school teacher knows them by name, if their uh, youth group leader knows them by name, if the pastor knows them by name, if the lady who's uh, doing the, the muffins knows them by name, because we are interested in their lives. This is how we prepare these kids to become those arrows and the warriors quiver to go and defend the family at the gates, right? There's another idea that I know that uh, Mr. Kleppen was here, talking about Forge Youth Mentoring. We have a couple mentors in the room. That's exactly, if you have no kids, we have kids for you, right? They're right behind the door. We, we, we get involved in mentoring and preparing these arrows because in some cases, when I grew up, I a, had a single dad. It's funny because I didn't know I had a single dad until I got to college and went to my psychology classes and realized, oh, yeah, I have a single dad because I had a church full of people who helped raise me. It was beautiful. I had a, a guy teach me how to drive. Another guy got me my first job. Another guy helped me to run the soundboard. All these things at church, the church community helped my dad raise his kids, and they're all awesome, especially this one, right? <laughs> that Darren kid's really humble. He's awesome. So, um, so that's, that's, that is our job, is to come alongside people, help their children become arrows in the warrior's quiver so they can defend the family. We are to be disciples who make more disciples. Here's this uh, verse in 1 Peter 2.5 that Jason's like, he popped by the office last night, dropped me some stuff off and said, hey, oh, you're preaching tomorrow? Oh, wow, here's a verse for you. He said, uh, 1 Peter 2.5, and we are, and you are living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. We are all becoming those stones that Jesus, the Lord, the builder, is using to build his kingdom, to build his family, to build his church. What starts with, uh, this all starts with our hearts, making sure we are right with the Lord, making sure we're ready to, uh, to be that person who's be, being willing to be a disciple, myself, grow, who makes more disciples, take someone else out for coffee, out for a Coke, take someone else's kids out to, to the water park or something, to do something with, so you can be passing on the legacy. Now, if you're in the room, you're like, um, I'm not really ready for that. Maybe you are recognizing that maybe your house needs a new builder. And that goes back to the beginning of this, of this passage. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Maybe you've been doing so much time building your house, doing your thing, building your company, building your name, building your whatever, and you are recognizing that I've been, I've been doing this. And maybe today is a chance you need to say, I need to go and change over to this. I need to go and make sure that God is the center of my stuff, not just part of my stuff. And these two pie charts really resemble most of us in the room, one or the other, right? Some of us have this, stop messing with me, Darren. You're meddling in my life. I like my pattern. I like my life. But is it pointless? Is it meaningless? Is it fulfilling? It may feel fulfilling because you're successful in the world's eyes. But I know that some of the poorest people in the world are the most in love with Jesus, Right? You see this, they go on mission trips. You see the people who have nothing, and they have the Lord, and that's enough. All right? So we want to, what's that look like for us? We need to first admit that we need a new build, and we need a new builder. And then we invite him to be every part of your life. Jesus gave us, uh, in John 10, 10, he says, I came to give you life and give you a full life. Not a wealthy life, but a full life. Jesus came to give us life and to give it to the fullest. So, so you might be asking, because I do this a lot, it's like, how does this psalm explain the gospel? I'm glad you asked. Because here's how it goes. The psalm points us to Jesus. The psalmist does a great job reminding us in the beginning of how pointless our life is without the Lord. All through life, we try to use our skills to get us ahead. 
We try to be good enough. Now, here's the thing. You can't, the bad news, you can't be good enough. There's some faith uh, organizations who feel like if my, if my good pile is bigger than my bad pile, I'll get to heaven. And the Bible says your good pile can't be big enough because your, big, your good pile is full of garbage. It's full of selfishness. Jesus is the only selfless one who paid the price for our sins. So the psalmist, and again, it says, without the Lord in it, why even guard your city? The Lord's not there. It'll be overrun, right? So all through life, we try to be good enough. Maybe we work hard, and we've forgotten that we need to help our kids grow in Jesus. Maybe we've done all the right things for the wrong reasons. So look at this. The right thing for the wrong reason is the wrong thing. So I need to get my bills paid and make lots and lots of money. Well, that's true, but if it's the wrong reasons, is it just to get ahead, to get notoriety, to get famous, to get rich, or is it to be able to use it to honor God, to support things? So this is all questions that we're not going to be able to answer in a one sermon that I planned last night in two hours. But for you guys, we have to process this. What does the Lord want from me? How can I take what the psalmist says and add, not just add the Lord to your life, but make the Lord the center of your life? You don't just sprinkle Jesus on your life and say it's all good. That's, that's baking. That's a recipe for disaster. You want to say, no, no, the Lord has got to be the center of my life. So if you're in the room and you think, well, I don't know what that is. Well, here's how it goes. God wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be in a relationship with us. Totally does. It's not a secret. But I, you, we have broken that relationship. We've sinned. We've messed up. And so with the, the idea of the gospel says that Jesus Christ, he paid the price. He, God says, I, I want to be with you so bad that I will send my son to die for your sins on your behalf. So Jesus comes. He lives that perfect life that we, can't, we can live. He has, he has no pile of bad. He is only good. So therefore, he is our Savior. He died on cross in our place because I can't die for my sins. I'm already dead. Spiritually, I'm dead. Jesus was spiritually alive. He died in my place. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day to show the world I am the way I said I am. I came to conquer death. Follow me. So we got this idea of he's done all the work. So this is why we need to stop the doing and just rest in the done. Jesus says it is finished. Stop trying to be good enough. You can't. Jesus is good enough. You trust in him. Believe that he has done what he's done and believe it in your hearts and you will be saved. So is today the day for you to become a believer? Is today the day for you to be, uh, to be saved, have that salvation? Maybe it is. If you're, if you're today and you're like, I've not done that, then today is the day to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry. I trust you as my Savior. Come and be the center of my life. Maybe you're in the room and like, you know what? I just need to change a lot of things. Actually, having the, 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 the pie chart that is the truth, it's not that difficult. It takes a little bit of readjusting, and it's not going to be instant either. It'll take some time. But think of this. As they go to the gates, they will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers. The accuser at the gate wants to shame you. You have your quiver full of arrows prepared to say, "Uh uh-uh. My legacy of faith goes all the way back to Jesus. And the gate accusers have nothing to say to you because your quiver of arrows are prepared to do battle for you. And you might be that arrow that does battle for somebody else to defend them, to show them, to help them, to grow them. So I want to also just to take a minute and we'll uh, do some worship. Everybody kind of close your eyes and just, just process, Lord, what, what do you want to teach me from this psalm today? What do I need to do to make sure you are the center of my life? And what do I need to do to make sure that the children in my care, in my, either my, as a parent or as a mentor or as a teacher, wherever you are, what can I do to make sure they are prepared to go into battle for me for the church, for the family, for all of us. Give you just 30 seconds of this process and I'll pray. Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you for um, reminding us that unless you build our house, our time is wasted. Unless you are part of defending our city, our time is wasted. And that's you are part of, of us being. It's, it's, a, it's a waste. So we know we, you're not asking us, Lord, to do nothing, to sit back on our heels and do nothing. You want us to be actively involved in your world. You want us to be actively involved in caring for and, and making uh, your world a better place. 
Lord, help us not to do it for our own glory, but for yours. Remind us that we need to do all we can do for you. You're the boss. Do it all for the glory of God, not for myself, not for, not for Harvest, not for Sila, but for you, Lord. May you be the one who, who pushes us along. And if there's someone in the room, Lord, that, they, that needs to decide to follow you, it makes it maybe the first time decision, Lord, Holy Spirit, just jump into their life, jump into their heart and help them to be confident, to be courageous and make that choice to choose to follow you. And someone in the room who just needs to rearrange things, help them to also be, to be courageous to follow you, to put aside their own selfish ambition and choose to follow you, put you at the center of all the things. And again, ask for help. We're not meant to do this thing alone or do it together. We are the family of God. Thank you for our kids and then the room next to us, the room downstairs. Help them to be continue to be growing in their faith as our teachers teach them as the rest of us consider what we can do to be an influence, to get to know the young ones in our church so we can make sure they are known and they can be prepared as arrows in our quiver to launch into this dangerous place you have sent us to. Thank you for all these things and pray that you would just be uh, at the center of all we do. Amen.